Helene Prashinsky vanished into thin air in January 1980 after commuting home from her intern job at a Denver radio station. Her lifeless body was found in an unoccupied field the following morning. For four decades, her murder went unsolved, with detectives relentlessly trying to identify her killer. Helene, then 21 and an enthusiastic university senior, was interning at the Denver radio station, a role she was very excited about and keen to make a sound impression. Ever since her younger days, she bore the aspirations of becoming a journalist, expecting the internship to be a stepping stone into the field. She had been in Colorado for a few weeks only, living with her aunt and uncle as she adjusted to her new environment. The radio station she worked at was near the bus station, but she had to walk six blocks from there to her residence. She got on the bus that ill-fated night, but didn't make it home. It was as though she dissolved in the short distance between the bus stop and her home, without a trace left behind. Her aunt and uncle initially assumed that she was working late, a theory that evaporated progressively as the night grew darker. Kitsy Snow, a friend of Helene's who was also living in the house, began to worry as they called Helene's boss for clues. He confirmed that she had clocked out at 6 p.m. as usual. The worrying escalated with every ticking minute, with Helene's aunt and uncle reporting her disappearance to the police at 10.30 p.m. On the evening of January 16th, Kitsy penned her thoughts in her diary. Her entry commenced with the following words, this has been the longest and worst day of my life. I am writing because I don't know what else to do. We waited for Helene to come home and waited and now it's 11 p.m. and no Helene. No call, no nothing. In the early hours around 9 a.m., a mother was passing through northern Douglas County on Daniels Park Road with her 13-year-old child when he alarmed her about something unusual. He pointed towards an open field, indicating the existence of a body laying there. Although the mother couldn't get a close look, Feeling alarmed by her son's discovery, she approached a road grader working around. The worker, upon investigation, confirmed the presence of a body. It was a young woman, naked and drenched in blood. It was no accident or natural death, as was quite evident from the cruel sight. Her arms were bound tightly to her back with nylon straps. The body wasn't concealed, which implied that the killer didn't bother to hide it. Anyone passing by the stretch of road could easily spot the body. Immediately, the police were informed, and they rushed to the scene upon receiving the alarming call. Interesting, or rather disturbingly, one of the deputies who worked part-time for KHO, the radio station where the dead young woman interned, recognized her. She was his co-worker, Helene. The autopsy report revealed several deep stab wounds on her body, obviously inflicted when she was left defenseless with her hands tied at her back. Before her merciless killing, she was sexually assaulted, and the investigators found the killer's semen samples at the crime scene. The killer had been reckless not only in leaving the body openly, but also in leaving behind the traces. The cold night and thick layer of snow on the grounds preserved the killer's footprints quite distinctly. From the impressions, they inferred the killer was likely to have been wearing cowboy boots. Adding to the evidence, Tire tracks near the crime scene were found, presumably the killer's vehicle while unloading Helene's body. Investigators followed every lead possible, capturing pictures and plaster castings of prints and tracks, and collecting any additional pieces of potential evidence. This included an empty milk carton, a can, and a piece of bread, all presumably discarded by the perpetrator. As snow began to fall in the field where the body of young Helen Pasinski was found, obliterating any clues, authorities called off their search of the area. Douglas County Sheriff's officers and investigators from the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, aided by volunteers from the Arapahoe County Search and Rescue Unit, spent much of the morning combing the area, hoping to turn up something to lead them to the girl's murderer, but found nothing. Ms. Puskinski's body was found early Thursday. She'd been sexually assaulted and stabbed. A college student working as an intern in the news department at KHOW Radio, she was last seen Wednesday afternoon when she left work. Inglewood police, also in on the case, have been concentrating their efforts near this bus stop on South Broadway. It's believed that Ms. Puskinski got off her bus after work here Wednesday night. She was abducted sometime after that. They've been talking with people in the area looking for some clue, but so far nothing. And they're afraid if they don't find something soon, they may not find anything at all. In the case under investigation, only one individual could potentially serve as an eyewitness. She reported observing a vehicle in proximity to the location where Helene's remains were discovered. Her testimony included a detailed account of a male figure she had seen near the said vehicle, which enabled the authorities to develop an artist's rendering of the suspect. 
Despite the availability of the sketch, it failed to trigger any valid leads or its association with anyone known in the vicinity. Meanwhile, the family in Helene's native Massachusetts, including her grieving parents and siblings, grappled with their loss. Her elder sister, Janet, had just welcomed her first child, a baby boy, into the world. Amidst their sorrow, Janet's family strove to preserve a sense of normalcy for the newborn, ensuring that he would experience a nurturing and emotionally secure upbringing despite the surrounding calamity. Janet later shared with journalists, quote, I think that just gave us a focus, you know. I think that without that, our life would have been in shambles. But that emptiness in our hearts stayed forever. Helene's passing profoundly touched her circle of friends. Kimberly Obremsky, a friend from high school, fondly reminisced about Helene, referring to her as such a piece of heaven, saying she was such an all-American, intelligent, caring individual. That's what makes it even harder. She had her whole life ahead of her. Over the course of 40 years, no significant leads emerged in the investigation of Helene's case. As time passed, her family aged without knowing what transpired during her final hours, while the perpetrator remained at large. By 2019, her parents and brother Chet had passed away, leaving only her older sister, Janet Johnson, alive at 70 years of age. On December 12, 2019, Janet received a phone call from a prosecutor working on Helene's case, informing her that a breakthrough had finally been made. Developments in forensic technology and genetic sequencing allowed the killer's DNA to be matched with relatives, ultimately leading to the discovery of the murderer. At the time Helene's body was found, Investigators had collected semen samples from her genital area. However, DNA profiling had not yet become a crucial component of forensic investigations, which largely relied on fingerprints, blood types, and other physical evidence back then. The first DNA fingerprint was used in a criminal case in 1986, six years after Helene's murder. Despite the police's ability to create DNA profiles for criminals in the 1980s, they were unable to identify the individuals involved unless they already had their DNA in a database. In 1998, Colorado investigators attempted to match the killer's DNA profile with the FBI's DNA database, but to no avail. It appeared that the murderer had always evaded capture, even for minor offenses. This was incredibly frustrating for the detectives. They had the killer's DNA, which held all the genetic information defining his identity, yet they were clueless about his name, residence, or appearance. However, by 2019, the situation had changed. Detectives and genealogists used the semen sample to create a DNA profile of Helene's killer and tirelessly constructed a family tree of possible suspects involved in the murder. They obtained additional insight into the suspect's DNA profiles by utilizing popular genetics websites like Ancestry.com.a. Substantial amount of effort and resources were poured into the case with over 20 detectives joining forces with Metro Denver Crime Stoppers and federal, state, and local law enforcement to collaborate. Although the case had gone cold years ago, the detectives believed they could still make headway. Among their numerous potential suspects was James Curtis Clanton, a 62-year-old truck driver living in Lake Butler, Florida. It was discovered that James had an extensive criminal record, having served time in Arkansas for a sexual assault conviction and also having been arrested in Florida for domestic violence. Regrettably, at the time of his previous arrests, James had never provided a DNA sample. He bore a resemblance to the suspect, as depicted in the composite sketch created around the time of the murder. James had spent the majority of his life in Florida, but had briefly worked for a landscaping company in Colorado during his youth. It was in this period that Helene was kidnapped, assaulted, and killed. After serving a four-year sentence for rape, James relocated to the area. Upon release, he was taken in by a past counselor residing in Denver. The day James set foot in Denver coincided with the day Helene failed to return home. While it could have been a matter of chance, the precision of the timing led the authorities to relentlessly seek a DNA sample from James. A team of investigators followed him diligently, hoping to secure a genetic sample for their investigation. There wasn't any considerable evidence to link him to the case. His basic connections to it were that he used to reside in the neighborhood and that his physical appearance was largely identical to the depicted image of the murderer. The situation was such that they were unable to access a formal search warrant to inspect his house. Hence, the alternative was to obtain a DNA sample from an object he discarded at a public location. Their initial effort at acquiring a DNA sample was from a discarded milk carton. Unfortunately, it didn't contain enough of his DNA for profiling. 
The investigators relentlessly tailed James, shadowing him at a neighborhood bar. Once he completed his drink and left, they quickly gathered the emptied mug. This time around, the saliva content on the beer mug was enough for DNA profiling. In the press briefing, District Attorney George Braunschler shed light on the intricate probe that was being carried out discreetly. He said, quote, there's DNA and that's a big part of this case, but don't misunderstand that it's like, hey, we just entered DNA into some voodoo database and out popped this guy. She said, quote, I want people to know what a special person Helene was. She was my best friend and she had a bright future ahead of her. The detectives and everyone else who helped make this day happen are my heroes. While under arrest, James readily confessed to the killing. He had evaded justice for nearly four decades, but it seemed as if he realized there was no way out now. His confession went beyond admitting to abducting, violating, and killing Helene. James provided further information about the crime, revealing that he had repeatedly assured Helene of her release, which she believed. However, he never planned to fulfill that promise and ultimately stabbed her nine times. When you stabbed her in the field and left her there, did you pose her body at all? Did you like lay her the way she, she was laying or did you no. like, okay, so you just stabbed her and walked away? Yes. Okay. Did, uh, and you said she didn't, her, she never cried. She was nice to you the whole time. Yes. Uh, when you stabbed her, did she ask you why or did she just? I don't think she expected me to, that I told her to get down on her knees. And I told her, I said, don't get up until you know I'm gone. And that's when everything else went a totally different way. Okay. And um, now you just said that you don't, you, you think you threw the knife in the field, but you're not sure. I wouldn't swear to. Okay. It. Do you have any idea where the knife could be if you did not throw it in the field? Could it be in your trailer still? Could it be in No, your... it ain't up here. Okay. It ain't There's nothing there. up here from that time. Okay. Despite James admitting to the murder of Helene in his conversation with the police, it didn't change the fact that the crime was brutally violent. If he had confessed soon after committing the crime, there could have been a possibility of a reduced sentence or plea bargain. However, after 40 years of living a normal life and not revealing his heinous act to anyone, his confession now held less weight. James could not be charged with sexual assault, as the statute of limitations for that crime in Colorado was only five years. But there was no statute of limitations for kidnapping or murder. Consequently, he was charged with second-degree kidnapping and first-degree murder. On February 21, 2020, James Curtis Clanton pleaded guilty to first-degree murder after deliberation, which was a Class I felony. The sentencing took place on July 1st, with participation from nearly a hundred people in the hearing. Janet Johnson, Helene's sister, was the first person to address the court. She spoke for five emotional minutes, sharing the impact her sister's death had on her life, both in 1980 and up to the present day. Before starting her statement, Janet acknowledged her role as the lone family member able to speak at the hearing, as her brother and parents had passed away and would never know their daughter's killer was finally brought to justice. It was a heart-wrenching scene as Janet fought back tears throughout her speech. Oh, how they wished, hoped, and dreamed of this day. A day of reckoning, an arrest, a conviction, justice. I will try my best to speak for all of us. Janet conveyed with deep sentiment how her family adored their youngest member, Helene. Helene was born when their eldest brother, Chet, was 12 years old, and Janet was 9. Janet expressed in her own words that Helene was not just the youngest, but indeed the light of their family. The pain they felt the agony of losing her was indescribable. The loss devastated their family to its core, changing them forever. Overwhelmed with grief, Janet found herself weeping every night when she went to bed, remembering her slain sister. The thought of the immense sorrow her parents must be facing adds to her own agony. They had enormous expectations for Helene, as they believed her life was set for phenomenal things. However, an unknown assailant abruptly ended that promising life. She said, Our world was shattered when we received that phone call 40 years ago. It was as if someone had reached in and torn our hearts out. I cannot find the words to accurately express the pain and anguish and heartache that my family experienced that day and every day since. In court, Janet refused to look in James's direction, saying, quote, I don't want to hear a word or see him because I have not been able to hear from my sister in 40 years, so I have no desire to hear what he has to say or see what he looks like. James refrained from speaking during the hearing and had his lawyer convey an apology to Helene's family and friends. In the apology, the attorney mentioned that James only began to feel regret for Helene's death after having a child. 
as it made him aware of the pain he inflicted upon Helene's family. Numerous friends from Helene's high school and college were present at the sentencing hearing, sharing memories of their times with Helene and the anguish her death had caused. Jackie Snow, a friend who had stayed at Helene's aunt and uncle's house on the night of the incident, read excerpts from her journal, highlighting the distress she experienced due to Helene's disappearance and the subsequent discovery of her remains. Another friend addressed the court and shared their thoughts, saying, When you were in the company of Helene, you knew that the world was good. That was taken away from all of us by this man's despicable acts. Following Judge Teresa Slade's verdict, James was given a life sentence. However, due to the regulations prevalent when Helene's murder took place, he is set to be eligible for parole once he turns 83, which would be after two decades of imprisonment. This case has endured for a long time but only saw a brief duration in the courts, Judge Slade commented during the proceedings as she addressed James directly. She continued, It has taken 40 years to reach this point. Despite taking away Helene's opportunity to experience family and life, you were able to enjoy these privileges. Although James has potential for parole, it doesn't ensure he will receive it. Thus, there's hope that this cruel person will breathe his last within the confines of his prison cell.